welcome to everyone online. Whether you're joining us at home or in the building, this is the day the Lord has made and we will rejoice and be glad in it. Amen. Thank you, God. Praise you, God. Jesus. Our redemption. Our redemption. Our salvation. We see His blood. Every hand's clap.
our country, God. We look to you, Jesus. You're so worthy, Lord. Peace like a river wash over me. Must me in water as deep as the sea.
heaven break out, God. Heaven to earth, God. Church, give God a shot of praise this morning. Lift up your voice, church. Give God a shot of praise today. If you trust Him, if you believe Him, you love Him. Amen. Now, church, those are powerful words for us to be singing today. It's a declaration that we want God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do you know that in heaven there is no sickness, there is no shame, there is no fear, there's no condemnation, there's no depression, there's no anxiety, there's no animosity, there is no strife. And so when we're singing these words today, church, we're saying, Lord, we will submit our lives to Your sovereignty and Your will. Just have Your way in us. And we're instructed to pray like this, church. It's not a romantic notion. We are told to pray like this when Jesus teaches us how to pray. Matthew 6, Luke 11, He says, pray, Lord, Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So we don't pray with timidity. We don't pray with fear. We don't pray with holding. We pray with confidence today to know that God is on our side. He wants to accomplish His will in our lives. So let's approach the throne of grace with confidence today, church. So whether you are at home or here in the building, let's put our hands on our hearts as we trust the Lord to do His will in our lives. Our dear Father, we live in a world that is broken and confused, where we are experiencing pain and sickness. But Lord, we know that You are still on the throne. We know that You are still way higher than all of these things that we're facing. And so we pray, Lord, have Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. We pray for relationships, Father God, for reconciliation to be faced. We pray where there's sickness in bodies, where things are are seeming dire and terrible, that You bring healing in Jesus' name. Father, for those who've experienced lack upon lack upon lack and frustration upon frustration, we ask in Jesus' name that You'd provide jobs, provide income, provide work, Father God. We pray for breakthroughs in Jesus' name, Lord, in this world. Let Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. In Jesus' mighty name we pray. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen. Come on, church, give God a shout of praise today if you trust Him. Amen.
Well, isn't it good to be in the house of God, joined together again for another wonderful Sunday. It's so good to see all of you in the building. It's so good to have every single one of you joining us online. It's going to be a phenomenal day. Amen. Who's happy to be here today, church? Fantastic. Well, normally we would tell you to turn around and greet a few people, but we can't do that. So turn around and wink to a few people as you take your seats at home. Just carry on being comfortable and snug in your pajamas your lazy t-shirt. So good to have every single one of you with us here today. Now we love that in this season, we're still able to welcome visitors into our home. So is anybody here for the very first time today? Just give me a small wave if today is your first time. Welcome. So good to have you with us. Church, give our visitors a round of applause. So good to have you with us today. Now, if you have joined us for the first time, if you're in the building, you're welcome to scan the code behind me with your camera on your phone. It'll take you to a page where you can see our visitors brochure and leave your details if you'd like us to get in touch. If you're with us for the first time online today, it's so good to have you joining us. You're also able to follow the links uh, below if you're on YouTube or go to the website. You can find that same visitors brochure. We'd also love if you'd love to leave your details with us and we will be in touch to share any more information that you'd like to know about who we are as a church. Amen. Well, in this COVID season, church, we just want to encourage you while you're seated, please keep your masks on. And a mask on makes sure that it's not just over your mouth, but don't be the mouth mask person. Cover your nose and your mouth so we can make sure that we are maintaining all of our protocols. And just a reminder that tomorrow morning, bookings will open for youth and young adults on Fridays. Youth and young adults has been absolutely incredible. We've been loved being back in person. And then on Wednesdays, we'll open up our bookings for the weekend services just remember, we've got thousands of people trying to book for the same service. So it gets very exciting. Uh, so just bear in mind that many people get in early to make sure that you can reserve your seat on Wednesday morning at 8.30. And we just love having people back in the house. Amen. Man, it's my first service back in Samson again. It's actually quite emotional seeing everyone here. This is absolutely incredible. Well, church, it's a very special time of the service now where we get to give to the Lord. And on the screen behind me, some details were going to come up on how you are able to give today. If you're joining us online at the bottom of the screen, you'll see the various ways that you're able to give. But before you do that, you can get a bit of information. But before you give, let me just take a moment to encourage you. In the books of Ezra and Nehemiah, we read about a time when God's people were in exile. Jerusalem was destroyed, the walls were destroyed, the temple was destroyed. It was a, an awful time for the Israelites to be alive. But under the leadership of Ezra and Nehemiah, the Israelites started to return to Jerusalem and they rebuilt the walls, they rebuilt Jerusalem, they rebuilt the temple. It was a wonderful time of celebration, seeing progress for God's people. But Nehemiah noticed at one stage that people had neglected the house of God. And this is the challenge that he brings them in Nehemiah chapter 13. He says, So I confronted the officials and asked, Why is the house of God forsaken? And I gathered them together and set them in their stations. Then all Judah brought the tithe of the grain, wine, and oil into the storehouse. There are a few parallels over here that I'd like to draw your attention to that are particularly poignant for us in the space that we find ourselves in here today. Because like the Israelites, we too have been in a period of exile. It's like we've been driven away from our home. We've had a, the last 14 months outside of God's house. It's been a period of exile. For many people, a period of destruction. Many people have felt like their lives have been destroyed. But thank God that we've now come to a point of return. I'm so grateful that we can finally meet together once again. We've come out of exile into return. Now, quite unlike the story, the house of God is not in ruins. In fact, over these last 14 months, we have seen people coming back to the house of God. We've seen growth. We've been see, uh, seen people responding to the Lord. Who's been grateful for online church? The fact that we could still worship and be together over the weekends, it's been amazing. But now that we have returned, we do need to ask ourselves, have we been forsaking the house of God? Or are we ready to continue to build the house of God in the way that we should? You see, there was a period of distraction or exile. There was a time of return, but now we're in a time of supply. It's time for us to build church. It's time for us to bring what we can to the house of the Lord, because the word goes on to say that all of Judah came and gave their tithes. The Hebrew scribes didn't exaggerate. When they said all of Judah, they meant all of Judah everyone recognized that they had a part to play. 
everyone knew that they could do something. So from the lowest income earners to the highest income earners, everyone felt the burden to say, man, there's something that I can do. And the most basic way that we can show that we're not forsaking the house of God is through our tithes and our offerings. It's been payday this week. Many people have been paid. The very first thing that we should do is say, Lord, this belongs to you. In fact, a couple chapters earlier, in chapter 10, Nehemiah speaks about giving to the house of the Lord, and it says, we obligate ourselves to bring our first fruit of our ground and the first fruit of the fruit of every tree. We obligate ourselves. We don't need somebody to remind us. We don't need somebody to instruct us. We don't need somebody to say, hey, this is what you should be doing. No, we ourselves carry the burden of the house of the Lord because we know what the house stands for. We know what the house of God is doing. We know what the house of God is going to accomplish. And after a time of exile, we are determined that the house of God is going to be stronger and more magnificent than ever before. So we will do what we can do to give to the house of God. So let's today, church, let's bring our tithes. Let's bring our offerings. Let's not forsake the house of God. And let's enjoy this wonderful celebration of giving to God together. Amen. Well, now you can take a look at the details behind me, the various ways that you're able to give. And right while we are here, I'm going to jump onto my Rivers Church app because that's one of the ways that you can give. I'm going to go to the give section. I'm going to punch in my stuff. I'm going to say give. And it's opening snap scan for me because it's magical and wonderful and anointed of the Lord. And fingerprint. And I'm almost done. There we go. Quick and easy, just like that. You can give via SnapScan through your Rivers app. Credit card and cash giving is available at the information counter or the EFT details are over there. Amen. Is everyone doing good? Great. We normally hold our envelopes to give and pray, but why don't you hold your phone today as a symbol of your giving and let's pray and commit our giving to the Lord. Our dear Father, we're so grateful that we have returned and that we can supply the needs of your kingdom to help your people. Father, we pray today that as we have given, that you bless every giver abundantly. I pray in Jesus' name that you'd supply their needs, bring them to a season of abundance, that we could bless your house and bless your people. May we be a conduit of your blessing. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Well, church, we're so excited for the Youth and Young Adults Conference coming up in just a few short weeks. So as you finalize your giving, let's have a look at the screens. The serious pneumonia outbreak in Wuhan, China. A new type of coronavirus. Find little rest. This is going to get worse. Before the head officer began in South Africa, which has been battling the containers. Is dictated by my personal responsibility. You've got to let go of your butt and allow God to move in your heart. Sometimes when you find yourself in a season of confusion, the best thing you can do is preach to yourself. It's say, soul, stand up and bless the Lord. Stand up and give God praise. There we go. Hello, church. Hello, Kyle Army. And hello to everyone today online. So good to see you. We're glad to be in the house together. Amen. We thought we would just both come up and just greet the church. Um, there are a few people in our church who are COVID positive at the moment. One is on the point of being hospitalized, um, and some are waiting for their tests at I'm so grateful to God that people are staying in touch to let us know how things are going. And um, also one of our very faithful um, men, young men, was knocked off his bicycle, was in a coma for about a month, and uh, he's come through. And, you know, it's just things that we feel because we've been on lockdown and now we're here, we just need to take a minute or two just to say, how much we appreciate our spiritual house, our mm. house of faith, and that we do care for everyone. I want to also encourage everyone, Pastor Andres asked me, to say, please, when the vaccines open for your age group, please go and do it. We went on Wednesday. Um, <clears throat> I said, how do you know if you've survived a vaccine? Uh, 
because in the car, we were two minutes in the car and we had a ding dong on the road because someone was spinning their wheels. But anyway, that's how you know you survived your vaccine. <laughs> so just to encourage you, church, Kailami, uh, we long to see you. We'll be there who knows when. Um, but just to say, we pray for you, send in your prayer requests. We go on a prayer walk. We walk praying with your name if you send your name. And uh, we really do appreciate you. Yes, we appreciate you. We're trusting God for the second vaccine. And uh, take care, wear your mask, uh, wash your hands, and stay away from people. In the supermarkets, people just they brush right up against you. You move away, you take care, and let's do what we can to keep moving forward in these difficult days we're living and keep trusting God. Keep hope alive. Amen. Amen. Well, before we go to the Word this morning, uh, you can get ready in uh, Kalami and online, whether you're sitting in your pajamas, get your phone, make some notes. I'm going to get Pastor Boom to pray. Pray for us as we go to the Word that God would speak this morning. Come, let's pray together. Father God, we're just always so grateful for your power in our lives, for your presence in our lives, and your protection in our lives. And Lord, we just thank you for this moment that we can be in your house, or if we're not in your house, we can be together, as it were, um, logged on and listening to you and experiencing your presence. We commit to you all those who are not well today. We commit to you those who are COVID positive, yes. those who are in hospital, yes. those who are afraid. Lord, mm. may your peace settle down on them. Yes. Lord, we open our hearts now and, and we know that this word is going to minister deep into our spirits and into our souls. And we just thank you always for your goodness in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Well, are you ready for the word? We're going to continue in our series. And before we do, let me remind you uh, today online and in Kalami and in the room, whenever you hear a message, you know, some messages are not for you right now. They don't apply to you. You go, man, this is a good message, but I'm not going through that right now. How many of you can relate to that? I'm sure uh, in Kalami and online you can relate to that. Here's the thing. You've got to ask yourself, when can I use this message? And uh, where can I use this message later on? And then this is the third thing. Who needs to hear this? When, where, that's for me, but then who needs to hear this? I'll tell you, sometimes when you're listening to a message, you know, someone comes to mind. Now, you don't go and prod them and God told me, don't just say, you know, I thought of you today that this could help you. And if you do that, guess what? Every single time you're in church and every message you hear, no matter who preaches it, will give you benefit. And we don't ever want to come to church and the following week go, well, last week it didn't help me. No, we need to lean in. Where can I use this? When can I use this? Who needs to hear it? Amen? Well, we're continuing in our series this, uh, this Sunday of uh, the traits of highly miserable people. Not miserable people, because everybody gets miserable from time to time. Um, and don't go home and nudge each other. You heard the message this morning. No, highly miserable people. They just are never happy. And God wants us to be happy and filled with His joy. But uh, we've got to understand the traits in ourselves and then deal with them. I read a very interesting story that in September of 2007, an inventor unveiled an ice cream machine, a very unique ice cream machine, at an electronic affair in Austria. And uh, what would happen is, when you, when you wanted ice cream from this machine, you would speak into the machine, and uh, it, would, it would read the voice stress, uh, the stress in your voice, and it would detect how stressed you are and how unhappy you are, and it would give you ice cream according to your stress level. If you were very stressed and very unhappy, the machine would read that, and you would get more ice cream. That's what you say, that's great. No, listen, we don't need more ice cream when we're unhappy. We need more truth when we're unhappy. <laughs> Notice this verse in Proverbs 15 as we start off today. It says, for the despondent, the miserable, every day brings trouble. For the happy heart, life is a continual feast. You see, you are satisfied. You, you eat and you have a joy in your life. Spiritual food comes 
when you're not miserable, and God doesn't want you to be miserable. And I want to speak today on an important topic, and I will explain it carefully, because there's a lot of negativity surrounding this topic, so stay with me. Don't switch off right at the beginning. If you've been online onto the internet, you'll see churches like ours are attacked because we touch on this topic. But it is a very important topic, and it is a trait of highly miserable people. And it is this, they constantly struggle with low self-esteem. People who struggle with low self-esteem are often very unhappy, and they make everyone else unhappy. Isn't that the truth? And um, low self-esteem simply means this. You don't think of yourself as you should, and you don't think of others as you should. If you think lowly of yourself, guess what? You will think lowly of other people too. And we need a godly self-confidence. Nathaniel Brandon is a psychiatrist, and they consider him an expert on self-esteem. And he says this, no factor is more important in people's psychological development and motivation than the value judgments they make about themselves. Every aspect of their lives is impacted by the way they see themselves. If you feel inadequate to face challenges, unworthy of respect or, res uh, or love, sorry, unworthy of love or respect, unentitled to happiness, and fear assertive thoughts, wants, or needs, if you lack basic self-trust, self-respect, and self-confidence, your self-esteem deficiency will limit you, no matter what other assets you possess. So you can have huge gifts, huge talents, huge ability, but it will keep coming back to how you feel about yourself, and that will affect your relationships with others. How many of you have met highly skilled people who just can't get on with others? It's, it, that skill is, is, is lost. I mean, a doctor who doesn't have good uh, uh, bedside manner, it's like, I ha this doctor's good, but I hate going there. How are you? Sit down. Open your mouth. No, it's just you, relationship ability is far more important than skill sometimes. And in employing people in businesses, they say people without relationship ability are the, the biggest uh, loss of profits and conflict in the workplace. Mariah Carey, who loves uh, being on stage and being adored by fans, it, it's, it's, it's not a normal thing. She actually says, I've always had low self-esteem and people do not recognize that growing up different, being biracial, having the whole thing where I did not know if I fit in, that is why music became such a big part of my life because it helped me overcome those issues. And guess what? If you need audiences to keep worshiping you to overcome your lack of self-esteem, guess what? When your ticket sales are down or if some other singer is more popular than you, you see, your self-esteem cannot be built on fans, money, or talent. It has to come from knowing who you are in God. And we will talk about that in a moment. Zig Ziglar, who has passed away, we had hoped to invite him to Rivers Church. He was a Baptist uh, preacher and a motivational speaker and author. His books are worth reading. He said, it's impossible to consistently behave in a manner inconsistent with the way we see ourselves. We can do very few things in a positive way if we feel negative about ourselves. Now, let me just take a moment here before we get into the full content of the message to say this. Lots of criticism has been leveled at the church for speaking about self-esteem. Jesus did say in Mark chapter 10, love your neighbor as yourself. Now, he wasn't really speaking about self-esteem, but the principle is true. You will only be able to love others as you love yourself. If you don't look after yourself and look after your own home and your own body, guess what? The chances are you're not going to look after anyone else. It's a simple principle, and he wasn't speaking about self-esteem, so we don't use that verse as the anchor for self-esteem. But here's our problem in our world. When people have low self-esteem, psychologists and psychiatrists tell them not to feel guilty. Guilt is a Christian thing. It comes from the Victorian era. And if you feel guilty, you must shake off that nonsense and rise up and realize you're just as good as everyone else. That's not sound theology. The Bible teaches us that we are sinners and that we actually are fallen. That's why we suffer from guilt. But now the cure is not the same as psychology, where it tells you to go and go to a spa and mix with people and, 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 and just stand up in a crowd and, and realize who you are, you know, and you're just as good as the next one. 
and shake off that Victorian Christian guilt. No, we don't listen to that. We come to the Bible. We don't go to an ice cream machine. We go to the Word of God, and we find a feast there for our souls, and we find out who we are. How many of you realize that in today's world, the biggest issue facing people is identity? They don't know who they are or why they are. Amen? And I'm going to tell you today just seven things here, and then I'll give you some ways of overcoming this thing, but seven uh, factors that cause loss of self-esteem. Why do people have low self-esteem? There's seven key reasons. I could give you more, but just in the time we have today. And um, number one, firstly, is an oversensitive conscience. You have a conscience, but if it's oversensitive, then you'll feel guilty about every single thing in your life, every little sin, every little weakness, every little failure, and you'll find it hard to forgive yourself and to forgive others. And what, what, what an oversensitive conscience does, hear me online today and in Kalami, is it makes us harder on ourselves and others than God is on us. God is a God of judgment, but we can end up beating ourselves up when it's not God's will for our lives. Are you with me? And here's the thing you have to ask yourself, am I convicted or am I condemned? Because the Holy Spirit convicts, but the devil and an oversensitive conscience condemns. And here's a truth for you this morning. You can be pleased with nothing when you're not pleased with yourself. You will end up miserable because every single fault in life you will see, you will see it in others, and you will say, my conscience is healthy. No, it's oversensitive. Number two, the second reason is people are overly self-conscious, overly self-aware, and they're aware of every little weakness and failure in their lives, every little flaw, and uh, it leads to kind of like a self-hate. A lot of people have self-hate. Maybe you were born with some defects, birth defects, birthmarks. Maybe you think your ears are too big, your eyes are too small, your hair's not the right texture, your skin's not the right color, you're not the right height, you're not the right weight. There's certain parts of your body that are bigger than others. And you look at magazines and you see people who are perfectly proportioned and you get angry at Barbie because you feel it's not fair. And we go through all these angry, you see, even see protests online. You know, now, now what they're popularizing is my 700 pound life. You know what that is? That's an attempt to, to, to increase self-esteem when you, when you can't have self-esteem when you're doing, when you're eating yourself to death. You've got to actually deal with the root of the problem. Can't have everyone online admire you and say, yeah, you just, yeah, no, you're fine. Yeah, we think you're great. No, you're not great. No person is normal at that weight. That's not, you have to deal with the issue. However hard it is, no, but we learn to entertain ourselves and, you know, we dare not say anything about anybody. Sometimes you can have just small areas of your life and you can start to feel overly self-conscious about them and you feel uncomfortable all the time when you're with other people. Now, Sidney J. Harris, a uh, wonderful author, he says, when you run into someone who is disagreeable to others, you may be sure he is uncomfortable with himself. The amount of pain we inflict on others is directly proportional to the amount we feel within us. You can't be happy with yourself, uh, unhappy with yourself, and be happy with others. You will take it out on other people. And here's the thing, if you're overly self-conscious, you will be very self-aware. People around you will feel it, and they will withdraw from you. So you will end up not only miserable, but lonely. And so that is, a, that is one of the things we need to deal with. Number three, the third thing is uh, background of negativity and rejection. If you've got a background of negativity and rejection, you've grown up in a family that criticizes other people as a supper time occupation. How many of you know that? You know, as soon as dad opens his mouth, he's being negative about someone, and then mom adds to it, and then they discuss the neighbors. Now, everybody talks about other people. That's just a, the way we are. But if you've grown up in a negative home, anytime you make a mistake, your parents are down on you, um, and you've suffered rejection in your life, uh, I know what it's like when I was younger. I was sent to a boarding school. My mother couldn't cope with me. I was a little bit of a rebel, and uh, that was the best way a single parent could cope. But boarding schools often lead to deep, deep issues in people's lives, and they just never recover from it. 
Now, it might be funny, but it's true. And uh, I remember there used to be a sticker that they put on the back of car windows, I survived Catholic boarding school. Because that isolation, that, that severe religious environment, it can lead to deep feelings of rejection, and that can cause low self-esteem in adulthood that keeps haunting people. I wasn't valued. My parents were negative and critical. My home life wasn't good. And then you go to school, and you're bullied at school. You know, you, you, you never fit in with the crowd, you know. They're always laughing at you and, and mocking you, and you see it in films all the time. And I think that, uh, that, that you can feel stupid, and, and, and as a result, it carries on into your life, and it has a deep, lasting impact on us. Uh, interesting that Lady Gaga, she um, uh, was speaking about her daily self-esteem struggles on a HBO, that's a channel they have in America, HBO, and she was speaking on a special that they had in 2011, and she says, I still sometimes feel like a loser kid in high school, and I just have to pick myself up and tell myself that I'm a superstar every morning so that I can get through this day and uh, be for my fans what they need me to be. And, and it, haven't you found it interesting, uh, if you're watching at home and in Kalami this morning and here, that some of the most beautiful people suffer from low self-esteem? See, it's not an external thing. It's, it's how you think about yourself. And it's what God has either done in you or not done in you, yet that uh, comes into play. Angelina Jolie considered her and Brad Pitt considered one of the most beautiful couples, but she had serious issues with her father, John Voigt. She never spoke to him, and he's a committed Christian. He's a conservative Christian, in fact, very outspoken, hated by Hollywood. But uh, she had big issues with him because she's so liberal, never spoke to him for many, many years. And finally, they reconciled and they agreed not to talk about politics, but she struggled with low self-esteem, even though she's famous. Now, in a book called The Answer, by two businessmen, uh, John uh, Asaraf and Murray Smith, they, they speak about the negative messages that we get sent from the time we're young. What happens in the home, you know, talking about rejection here, negativity. And they say this, they say, by the time you're 17 years old, you've heard, no, you can't, an average of 150,000 times. You've heard, yes, you can, about 5,000 times. So they say, here's the math. That's 30 numbers for, 30 no's, sorry, for every yes. That makes for a powerful belief of I can't. Isn't that true? And so you, a lot of what we have in adulthood comes from our younger years, and it can make us miserable. And rejection is something we need to come to God for healing of. And something as a Christian, sometimes you have to work through from time to time. You have to say, no, I will not feel that. I will realize who I am. You remember Elijah was a great prophet, and uh, he challenged the prophets of Baal, but the minute he faced rejection by Jezebel, he went and hid in a cave, and uh, he said, it's better that I die. I'm no better than my ancestors. In fact, he said, Lord, take my life. I'm no better than my ancestors. Low self-esteem starts to rule when there is rejection. This is making sense today. I trust this is helping you and making you aware of yourself, all the people around you. When can I use this? Where can I use this? Or who needs to hear this? today. Number four, the fourth reason why people suffer from low self-esteem, even as Christians, is sexual or physical abuse. And you can grow up feeling if you've been abused by an uncle, a grandfather, a stepfather, a brother, a neighbor, a, a, a sexual abuse particularly, that intimacy, you can feel I'm no good, this is all I'm good for. And you start to feel like an object, mistreated by by your family, mis uh, ignored by your mother maybe, you told your mother she didn't listen, and so you feel, well, I don't, I don't have much value. Often people grow up in homes where they're physically abused, uh, smacking and hitting. You never know when, when you're going to get a backhand. And uh, in generations past, you know, your father wouldn't even warn you. We just simmer, as they say in Afrikaans, clap you at the table. Bwah! There you'd go flying, and the rice and the curry would be all over the floor. Get up. And you'd get up and you'd wipe yourself and next day you'd have a black eye and uh, you would have learned your lesson. How I many you know, you, you don't grow up to be a whole person when you have that kind of experience. We need to discipline our children, but not in that way. And uh, if you've grown up like that, you've been sworn at. This is why women are often gravitate to men who treat them like that, because it's like normal. When a boyfriend just slaps them around, it's like normal. That's how I've grown up and you can end up with very low self-esteem. Number five, is this okay? Failures in relationships can cause you to have very low self-esteem because you just don't get on with people. 
and their friction with friends. You're always causing friction. There's always issues with friends. They, people leave you, don't like you, talk behind your back. Maybe you've got divorce. There's been one or two divorces. And um, there's friction in your family, and they blame you for it. And you don't get on with the rest of the family. And what happens with that is you struggle to trust yourself, and you struggle to trust others. Because you just don't know where you stand with people. And you're fearful of being hurt. You become overly suspicious of people. You start to weigh up everyone's motives. What do they want from me? What are they trying to do? I know what you're like. This has happened to me before. And you can never be a confident, assertive accomplisher if you live with that kind of life. And uh, you become very needy when you're in that place too. And, and, and how many of you have heard the song, People Who Need People? The song goes on to say, Are the luckiest people? No, they're not. People who need people are the most miserable people because there's a deficit and then they're looking for it to be met by people and when it's not, they're even more miserable. This is the trait of highly miserable people. And if you understand why you're miserable, then you can deal with it. And uh, you often find people with this deficit need people to applaud them. They say comedians, and not all comedians, we've com got comedians in our church, but comedians often are people with a huge deficit a low self-esteem, and that's why they need people to laugh at them because they, they feed on that. Many of you would remember Robin Williams, and uh, you know he committed suicide, and he said this. He said, I think the saddest people always try their hardest to make people happy because they know what it's like to feel absolutely worthless, and they don't want anyone else to feel like that. Terrible thing, eh? And so... Uh, failures in relationship. Number six, there are two more here. Not knowing who we really are in Christ can cause real low self-esteem, even in mature Christians. We can know the Bible, but we mostly know the condemning or negative verses. And we don't know God as Father, loving Father, developing Father, and uh, we don't know our gifts and our place in Him. A lot of people don't know their talents and abilities. They don't know the gifts God's given them. And that's why even in the Christian world, Christians copy other people. You notice in the world, all the worship leaders look alike. You know, they've mocked it, the skinny jeans crowd. Now, I mean, thank God our team don't wear, you know, pants from 1950, we, unless they're in fashion. But, but, but there's a sense where you can copy musicians and actors because you don't have your own identity. We need a confidence in who we are. And I thank God that Rivers Church has a good self-esteem because we have our own expression, our own type of buildings. We have our own creativity. We haven't had to copy someone else. We are just us in our attempt to identify and reach the, the lost, but we haven't compromised the truth. And it's a healthy self-esteem. I'd like to think we are. And we've got to know who we are in Christ. Now, I don't have time this morning to delve into this, but when John the Baptist was asked who he was, he didn't say, I'm Jesus' cousin. It's my cousin. Now, he never played on that, even though it was his cousin. Are you with me? Now, most of us, and, and, and I, know, I know my poor mom, she's gone on to be with the Lord, but whenever she met people, you know, they, they would, she would be introduced, and then she'd, you know, she'd talk, yes, now my daughter's doing very well, you know, in the fabric business, and they owned their own, you know, they had their own branch. And then, my, you know who my son is, eh? And we always say, we thank God that I wasn't on television on Life but as long as my mom was alive. The neighbors would have suffered and you like to use your relatives to, or someone you know. There was a pastor who once preached here many years ago, and for about 10 minutes in the message, he just name dropped actors and famous people. Some of you will remember that, and we were like, get to the message. We know you're well known, and we know you're connected. John the Baptist didn't do that because he had a good self-esteem. And when they came to him, look here quickly, John chapter 1. Now, this was John's testimony when the Jews of Jerusalem sent priests and Levites to ask him who he was. He did not fail to confess, but confessed freely. I am not the Christ. They asked him, then who are you? Are you Elijah? Oh, well, almost. No, no, he didn't say that. I'm not. Are you the prophet? He answered, no. Finally, they said, who are you? Give us an answer to take back to those who sent you. What do you say about yourself? Can you see how crucial this is? Then John replied in the words of Isaiah. He found himself in the Bible. Isaiah the prophet, I'm the voice of one calling in the desert, make straight the way for the Lord. 
You see, we're not, who, we're not who people say we are. We are God says we are. And we have to keep going back to the Word of God to find out who we are. Our lives are hid with Christ in God. Yes, but look at the way you live. Yeah, but my life is hid with Christ in God, and God is still busy with me. He that began a good work in me will complete it on the day of Jesus Christ. And we've got to go back to the Bible, not try and use psychology and the self-esteem of psychology online to boost us up. No, no, we go to God's Word. Now, number seven, here's the last one. This is the one that causes a lot of self, low self-esteem in believers, and it's going to surprise you. Entertaining secret sin. If you entertain secret sin, you know the Bible, you tithe, you're committed, you love God, but you keep on with some very serious secret sin. You're sleeping with someone on an ongoing basis, and you hide it from your friends. You know it's wrong. I'll tell you what, it will destroy your confidence in God. Because you cannot have sin in your life and live a strong life. Ezra Taft Benson was an American farmer and he was a member of uh, their Congress. He was a minister of agriculture. And he says this, you cannot do wrong and feel right. It is impossible. Sin pulls a man down into despondency and despair. Miserable. The price of peace is righteousness. And you know, Satan's plan has, has been the same since the beginning of time. He promises you happiness and fulfillment to get you into sin, and then once you're in sin, you're in misery and despair. And we've got to resist it and deal with it because it becomes like a cancer in your life, eats away at your confidence, eats away at your self-esteem, and you feel like a hypocrite, and many people fall away from God because they're not able to deal with that area, and they, 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 they withhold their tithe, and they don't tell anybody, but it, it eventually gets you because it's a secret sin. You haven't told anyone about it. it it's, it's not sexual necessarily, but you, you, you're doing something. And I've got a list here. You're not pure in your thought life. You might be addicted to drugs. You hide it. You sniff cocaine. You might even come to church on a high. Man, the worship was awesome. Now, you laugh at that, but guess what? When I was a young Christian, I did that. I smoked dope, and then I went to church. And man, the Bible was deep. <laughs> and I had to repent of that because no one could show me a scripture that I shall not smoke dope. In fact, it said, all the herbs of the field he hath given thee. But you've got to come to a place where you go, I can't do this in secret. I can't smoke dope at home and then come to church and pretend. I can't keep up these habits, pride, rebellion to authority, not giving, sexual sin. I can't sleep with so-and-so. I can't be flirting with that person and talking to them. You know, it's amazing. We've got an estate that we walk through, fortunately a safe estate. There's 92 houses there. And there have been times when we've walked and we've seen someone park near their house talking on the phone in their car. And we're like, what are you doing? Why don't you go home? Because people are up to stuff. Now, you can't be a confident person if that's happening in your life. So these are the causes here. And David says this. He says in Psalm 19, people cannot see their own mistakes. Forgive me for my secret sins. Keep me from the sins of pride. Don't let them rule me. Then I can be pure and innocent of the greatest of sins. Let me give you five ways quickly to build your self-esteem. I've been long on problem and short on solution, but I think identification is important. Is this helping anyone today? I hope in Kalami and at you, where you are at home, online, are being helped today. Five ways to build godly self-esteem in Christ. And uh, I love what Zig Ziglar says as we kick off here. He says, the starting point for both success and happiness is a healthy self-image. You've got to be before you can do and you've got to do before you can have. Can you see this is the route to success? Feel good, feel strong, then you become an achiever. When you become an achiever, then you acquire the blessing of God. So not only is this affecting you emotionally, it could be effect affecting you financially and in your success. Number one, the first thing, and I've already alluded to it, but it's so important, if you're going to build godly self-esteem, find out who you really are from the Word of God. Find out who you really are from the Word of God. And let me say this to mature Christians. Remind yourself of who you are in Christ. Your origins. You're a human being created in the image of God. You're not evolved from animals. The monkey is not your uncle. You're not designed by accident. You didn't just happen. God thought of you. You were in His mind all your days before He created you. You need to go to that and realize that because of that, you have value. 
You have a purpose, and you don't measure yourself according to the world measures you. You don't try and bolster your, your self-confidence with arrogance. You just know, man, I know whose I am, and uh, I know where I am and why I am, and we realize that we've got intrinsic value even though we come from Adam and we're fallen. Isn't that true? It's like parents. If you're a parent today, you've got children. At times, you want to grind your teeth. And you want to say to them, how many of you can relate to that? And online and in Carl Army, I'm sure you can. But guess what? You love them. Why? Because they have intrinsic value. They come from you. They were created by you. And we need to understand that. Whenever you have theological problems, always bring it back to the family and you'll understand who you are and how much God loves you. Max Licardo in his book called You Are Special, wonderful book for children to read. He says, remember, you are special because I made you and I don't make mistakes. So we've got to go to the Bible and know who we are in the Bible and, and remind ourselves. You've got to be able to say, I am the righteousness of God in Christ. And, and go to the scriptures, 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 20. Go there and remind yourself, that's who I am. I'm a child of God. I was bought by the precious blood of Jesus 1 Peter uh, chapter 1 and verse 19. And then again in, 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 in 1 Peter chapter 2. For you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a people belonging to God. Once you were no people, now you are God's people. You remind yourself of that and that Jesus ever lives in Hebrews 7 to intercede for you. And he said in Hebrews 13, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And that he's forgiven us all our sins. And that now we don't have a righteousness of our own that comes by our performance, but it comes by faith. And we go to the scriptures in Philippians 3 and verse 8, and we discover that. And we realize we're no longer slaves, but sons and daughters of God. And so our identity must not come from our feelings or from silly methodology, but it must come from the word of God and find out and remind yourself who you are in Christ. Number two, you need to admit your faults, but receive the forgiveness Christ offers. One of my routines every day of my life before I go to sleep is to confess my sins, to ask for forgiveness, and then I pray for some serious needs that are in my heart. One of them is my friend in Cape Town, Pastor Donovan Kutzio. He's got a growth in his back, cancerous growth, and I pray for him before I close my eyes. There are one or two others that I've prayed like that for in our church who've had very serious uh, illnesses. And, uh, but I confess my sins because you know what? When you go to sleep, knowing that God loves you, you just keep the air clear. And uh, you admit your faults and you confess. And Psalm 32, David says here, there was a time when I wouldn't admit what a sinner I was, but my dishonesty made me what? Miserable. And filled my days with frustration. That's why people are highly miserable. All day and all night your hand was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water on a sunny day until I finally admitted all my sins to you and stopped trying to hide them. I said to myself, I will confess them to the Lord and you forgave me. All my guilt is gone. Do you notice honesty with God brings freedom, brings forgiveness, and we need to do this on a daily basis. Max Licardo in his book, Max on Life, says this, when grace moves in, guilt moves out. Remember that. Don't carry that because it will destroy your confidence in God. Admit your mistakes and faults and receive forgiveness. Number three, realize that in Christ we have high value. God doesn't tolerate you. He loves you. And at times you go, I wonder if I'm still in the kingdom. And if I am, I must be like one of those right at the back. Imagine the whole crowd, and there's some who are near the Lord, you know, like the pastors, they're right at the throne, you know. And then there I am, Jeez, I'm, I'm one step from out the door. No, God does not tolerate you. You've been included in his family, and you have high value in Christ. Listen, when God sees you, he doesn't see you, he sees his son. Remember that. He sees his son because through Christ, we have forgiveness. And when God looks down, he sees the blood. And he sees the sacrifice of his son. And we need to remember that. Ephesians chapter 2. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, have been brought near by the blood of Christ. For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus 
to do good works which God prepared in advance for us to do. God brought you near to use you. Yes, but, no, no buts. He knows all your issues and weaknesses, but wants to use you despite that because he wants you to display his grace, not just your natural talents. Otherwise, the most talented would be the most accepted like it is in the world, and the least talented would have the least value. We need to know that we are connected with him, and that's what gives us value. I was reading a story about a man who went to Paris on holiday many, many years ago, and uh, he found a store that uh, he went into, and uh, it seemed to have a lot of bargains and so on. It was almost like a flea market type place, and, and he found like a necklace, and he thought, gee, this looks very real. And, and, and so he decided he, he, he would buy it and take it home and uh, give it as a gift, you know. And then when he got back to, it was from New York, when he got back to New York, the, the, the customs went through his stuff and they looked at it and they, they found this thing and they held it up to the light and they looked at it. And then they charged him a mass of import duty on it. And he was like, eh? it was like a bargain. Anyway, they wouldn't let him bring it in. So he paid the import duty. Then he took it to a jeweler and he said, man, I paid this ridiculous import duty. Would you have a look at this thing? And uh, this is the import duty I paid. Have a look, tell me why they charged me so much money. So the jeweler looked at it through his thing, and he said, oh, I'll give you, you $20,000 for this. So the guy said, oh, wow. Wow. So he thought, no, that's strange. So he took it to another jeweler. He said, I took this to a jeweler, and I paid import duty on it. And uh, the jeweler said, let me have a look at it. And he had a look at it, you know, that little eye thing. And look at it, and he said, I'll give you 10000 more. I'll give you 30000 And he said, why? What is it about this necklace? And he said, come, look through the glass. But as he looked through the glass, he, he saw the little inscription from Napoleon Bonaparte to Josephine. You see, the necklace didn't have value in of itself, just that face value. But who it was connected to gave it its value. And you are more valuable because of who you're connected to. In Christ, we have high value. Number four, here's the fourth thing you need to do in the one minute and 47 seconds I have left. Resist the condemnation of the devil and others. Satan is a condemner and sometimes people are too. The Bible reminds us in Romans 8, who will condemn us? What can separate us from the love of God? And you have to resist the condemnation. Receive conviction, but resist condemnation. Because condemnation says you're nothing and you never will be anything. But conviction says you're too good for this. Let go of it and be all God wants you to be because you have value. And uh, in the world today, we, we have people who, who, who have two sort of extremes. They have low self-esteem or they have arrogance. Have you noticed that? People are either so, they don't know who they are, or they strut around. I mean, on Instagram posts, I hate sponsored posts. Be careful what you even look at because then they start sending you. I made so much money and I have, and don't let anyone post about Bitcoin on my posts. You will be deleted. <laughs> the minute people see there's 600 or 800 people liking something of mine, I invested 500 delete we need to get a good self-esteem understand something not not why did I go off track there and I only have one 13 seconds right your life consists of two things quickly write this down look on the screen and if you're watching at home and at Kalami, watch this the first area of our lives is justification that's the positional stance that we have in Christ because we have been forgiven our sins through Jesus, just as if we had never sinned, God views us as positionally righteous. Isn't that right? Wonderful, eh? But then the second one, and the two go hand in hand, and they almost contradict each other, but we need to understand the two together. This is how you resist condemnation, by the way, is sanctification. That's the practical side. That's who we really are. We still need to be changed and forgiven and cleansed, and we still need to grow. We are, but we aren't. Don't live in we aren't. That's condemnation of the devil. And don't live in just we are, because that is hyper grace, where you try and tell yourself there's nothing wrong with you, and you never confess your sins. They are two extremes. We need to live in the tension of both. I am but I'm not. 
but I know who I am in Christ. And God can work in me, and he can forgive me, and at the same time, I can stand in him. Number five, be done with besetting sin. Guess what? When you deal with besetting sin or secret sin, and you decide to be free from it, your self-esteem will go up. I believe it's a problem with many in the Christian church, and you know what people do? They gravitate to hyper-grace churches where they only teach grace. Guess what? So that it can soothe their conscience. But guess what? Secretly, you still know who you are, and now you don't have any method of dealing with it because that church will just tell you all the time, no, you're the righteousness of God in Christ. No, you're not a sinner. Don't call yourself a sinner. And so they harp on one aspect. Meanwhile, you need to be confronted with your sin, cut it off, and then be free. And you know how you do it. You make a decision. As I close today, the word decide comes from the Latin decidere, which means to cut off. And when you decide, you cut off options. Isn't that true? I decide to live like this. I cut off negativity. I cut off low self-esteem. I cut off condemnation. I cut off hyper-grace teaching that tries to lie to me. And I find myself in the true grace of God that forgives me. But then I realize I still need to grow. And his grace makes me grow. Are you with me? And it's a decision. And it's the same if you don't know Jesus today. If you're watching me online, you're in the room, you, you, you don't know the Lord Jesus, you cut off all other options, all other gods, and you make a decision that Jesus is Lord. And guess what? When your relationship with God is right, your relationship with people will be better. And once Christ comes into your life, he gives you a true self-esteem. I remember the first day I gave my life to Christ. I walked out feeling so complete. I know why I'm alive. I know who I am. I know I've got issues because they've just told me you're a sinner. I now know why I mess up, yet I've got such high ideals. I've got this desire for excellence, yet when it comes to certain things, I don't, I, I'm a contradiction. But now I know why. And I know Jesus. And now that I know him, now I can approach life correctly. And I'll tell you what, if you don't know Jesus today in the room or you've slipped away from your walk with him, decide today. And decide is not just making a decision, it's cutting off options. You, Lord, and no one else. You, Lord, and not secret sin. You, Lord, and not condemnation. And when you make that decision, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing. So in Kyle Army today, if you are with me and engaged with me right now, and if you're watching online and in the room, if you're here today, bow your head with me and we're going to take a moment to pray all across the room, even at home and in Kyle Army. And I'm going to hand over to uh, Pastor Chris in Kyle Army to lead you there and to lead you in prayer. Now, in the room and online, if you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life, remember a decision for him is what saves you. He doesn't automatically save you. It's like a bus. A bus can come past and you can go, there's a bus. Now, you've got to get onto it. And then you get, and, and Jesus is like, it. He's, he's coming past you today. You have to decide, I'm leaving the bus stop, and I'm getting on, and I'm moving on with God. And today, if you need to give your life to Jesus for the first time, or you need to recommit yourself, guess what? A joy comes, misery goes, and God wants to do that for you at home and right here today. If in the room this morning you say, I need to recommit my life to the Lord, I need to make a decision, I've wavered, and I've allowed myself to be dragged back, I'm going to ask you in just a moment to raise your hand. Not going to make you stand up, not going to call you out. If you need to make Jesus the Lord of your life, I'd love to lead you in prayer. We're all going to pray with you. And at home, you can pray too. But decide right now. So if that's you, so I need to recommit. I need to give my life to Jesus. Just raise your hand. Hold it up. And at home, maybe you can't raise your hand or maybe you can. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. That's great. Thank you. Number of people in the room. Thank you. Wonderful. Just respond to God and say, Lord, today, it's a decision. It's a cutting off. No alternatives. It's you. You can put your hands down. And at home, you can do the same. And I'm going to pray. And we're all going to pray out loud. I love doing this because we support one another in this wonderful transition. Let's pray like this. Thank you, Father, that though we are sinners, you sent your son to die for us. We believe in him today and receive the sacrifice of his blood for our sins. Lord Jesus, come into our lives. We decide today to make you Lord and we cut off all other options and serve you only. Lead us, Lord, 
Forgive us and cleanse us and make us new. In Jesus' name, amen and amen. Let's give God thanks for people responding. And if you responded at home, we really care about you as well. We thank God for you, uh, wherever you find yourself right now. And uh, we do have a booklet that we give people. We used to give it out at the doors in church services, a little book we specially wrote. And it tells you you've made a decision, but now there's a journey. But you can click on this QR code that comes up on the screen for the online viewer. And for those of you in the room, you can click on that code and it'll help you walk with God. And uh, we want you to make the journey. We want you to be all God wants you to be today. Don't you want to be all God wants you to be? How many of you in the room have been helped today? You know, when I woke up this morning, it was dark. It was cold. And my eyelids went. And I thought, Lord Jesus, let there not be a big drop off today. Let your people come and receive breakthrough. And I believe if you've been sitting here, how many of you felt that you received today? Fantastic. That's great. We love you. We appreciate you. Listen, when you leave the building, this is important. Try and remember to just stay a few paces away from people. And a natural tendency is to get out, get to your car. Just, just hang back. Make sure you stand away from people as you go through the door. Don't touch the handles. You know, just, just try and be conscious. Use your elbow. When you could travel up an escalator, use your elbow to steady you. You know, we're getting on nine years and we use the elbow. And um, just think about it because you can prevent the disease from attacking your life and from getting into others. And we trust God to get through this and to move forward in Jesus' name. God bless you. Have a lovely day.